There's a myth going round town that when you get older you just sit down and start rocking. Just rocking. In a way that's true, if you know what I mean. Just take a look at the senior scene. Well, it's rocking. Yeah, it's rocking. We're so happy that you joined us, and I know you're going to enjoy Mr. Frank Barrett, who is our guest today. Welcome, Mr. Barrett. Thank you. Nice we're, to be here. We're delighted to have you join us. Thank you. You've been such an active man all your life doing so many interesting things. I know you were with the Wildlife Commission. Yes. Mm -hmm. Would you tell me about some of the things you did with the Wildlife Commission for many, many years? My first assignment when I started with, with the Wildlife Commission in 1949 was to restore the deer herd. See? And that worked out too well. It uh, certainly has. <laughs> back then in 1949, the statewide kill was about 10,000. And we did a lot of trapping and transplanting. And of course, uh, I can't claim all the credit. Actually, much of the credit goes to the Enforcement Division of the Wildlife Resource Commission because they kept the poachers under control. And then the deer did the rest. They reproduced magnificently. And as I say, in 49, 1949, the statewide kill was about 10,000. Today, it's well over 200,000. So, and my reward for having restored, helped restore the deer herd is that they are now beating up my Christmas trees, so. Oh dear, <laughs> they're getting even with you. They're getting even with me. Do we yeah. have any estimate about how many there are in North Carolina now? About a million, about a about million. About a million. Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, roughly, very that's, roughly. That's yeah. about, a, mm -hmm. we're about eight million people, so yeah, it's about so. 12% then. Yeah. One for every eight people. Right, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. uh, do you see anything happening to lessen the number of deer? No. I mean, they really are a nuisance now. They really are a nuisance. They're uh, beautiful, but they're a nuisance. Well, they are. Uh, actually, the only, well, one, one, one cure would be to restore the panther, you know, and the uh, wolf, the gray wolf, but uh, of course that's not going to happen. Uh, the panther is extinct in North Carolina, and of course we, we now have the red wolves in eastern North Carolina, but uh, I doubt very much that they're going to spread over the state. We have coyotes, but coyotes were not going to have that much of an impact on the on, on the deer. And they're mostly in the mountainous area, aren't they? Coyotes? The coyotes are all over the state. Are they? Mm -hmm. Actually, we have, I have a picture of one in uh, just a few hundred yards from my house here in, in, in Raleigh. Mm -hmm. Well, just south of Raleigh. You're actually. out of Raleigh. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So they are all over the state now. Now, another animal that seems to be making a comeback that I believe you were involved with, with a lot of my uh, wildlife commission, was the bear. Well, yes. Uh, uh, that, too, was the problem. You know, we have very close working relationship with all of the sportsmen in the state, and the bear hunters were concerned. They were harvesting only about, well, between 180 and 200 bears per year. This was back in the 60s. And so we got together with them, and I set up a system of bear sanctuaries, 31 bear sanctuaries across the state most of them in the mountains or in the far east. And some of the eastern counties closed the season on bear hunting also. And that bear kill now is about 2,000 a year. So we've had, say, like about a tenfold increase in the, in the bear population as a result of, well, more protection and place for them to breed you know, unmolested. Now, one sees in the media that there bears are sometimes invading yards and other things. Is yes, this the, the, going to become a problem like the deer? I don't think it's going to be that much of a problem because bears really need to have a large wilderness area. Uh, that's what they prefer to have. But uh, of course, bears are like any other wildlife. If you don't target their molestation, you know, mm -hmm. uh, they will become more and more tame, so to speak. Uh, and it's, it's the targeted molestation that and the killing, that, of course, that, that uh, will redu reduce the population to keep them in, under control. But we have a very controlled bear season mm -hmm. uh, in the east and in the west, and uh, uh, it's fairly stabilized. I don't think that there's really going to be much of a problem. If a person were to come face to face with a bear, what should they do? Uh, 
just don't panic. Uh, just turn and go the other way. The bear's not going to bother you. They, they, they wouldn't attack. No, no, bear, bears are not aggressive that way. They'll mm -hmm. not attack. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember once uh, in the Adirondacks, this was, oh my goodness, about 1943, I think. Uh, I worked on wildlife research station up there for many, many several years. And uh, my wife and I and my first son were walking this w wild road, you know, wilderness road. And here come around the curve comes a bear, see? And uh, we looked at each other and the bear turned and ran that way. We turned and went this way. And that was the extent <laughs> of the confrontation, so. Um, well, one of the mistakes is people feeding them. Oh, well, now that, that, that can be, that can be really a real problem. That creates really hazards, doesn't no. it? Of course, uh, and you know, in the Yellowstone, that's a big right. problem there where the uh, bears have become very tame going to the garbage piles. Right. And then, of course, uh, by people feeding them, why that completely removes their fear of, of people because most animals, wild animals, are just stay wild. They, they right. don't like people and they stay away from people. So that that's where we're making errors is when we attempt to yes, tame it's these a human animals. error. It's not a bear right, problem. Right. Right. So. Now I understand you also are involved in raising quail, bobwhites. Well, marvelous animals <laughs> or birds. A beautiful bird, but uh, I'm not involved in raising them. I'm involved in trying to sustain the sport of hunting wild quail. See, uh, quail hunting has been a a uh, fascinating tradition all through the southeast United, all through the United States actually most of the United States and uh, through the 1980s uh, quail hunting was a very very popular sport and widely participated in uh, we had oh through the 60s and 70s um, perhaps uh, over a million people in North Carolina who hunted quail, see? Wow. And the annual kill was like about one and a quarter million birds a year, see? Um, and each of the southern states had their own program like that. And uh, actually, one of the programs that we were conducting at that time was quail habitat improvement. We were distributing planting materials to landowners to plant to provide food for quail. One of the primary ones was such thing as shrub lispidesa, a plant that grows about oh, about head high, and some varieties grow much higher than that, and produces a seed that quail just absolutely love. And so that was a very popular program because wherever you plant shrub lispidesa, you're always going to find quail there, see? And we thought at the time that we were helping the quail to survive, but in retrospect today, it appears that the main thing that we were doing were, was attracting quail to a place where they could be found. See? So uh, it was very popular because they could always find quail at the shrubless species of plantings. But starting, uh, there's been a gradual decline in quail populations over many years, but uh, very, very gradual, and hunting was very abundant, so to speak, um, uh, through about the 1980s. But then a rather drastic decline occurred and to, uh, even even and still continuing today, uh, so that as of now, year 2005, we probably have only about 10, 15 percent as of the quail that we had back then. You know, uh, back in the 80s and uh, 70s and 80s, and the stock explanation that we get from the state wildlife agencies is that we've lost our habitat uh, due to urbanization right. and farming methods have changed and that sort of thing. But, and, and I also believe that uh, response, but I was forced to change my mind several years ago because of several things. Uh, one, uh, we have lost our quail even in areas of very good habitat. We have many places where we have excellent habitat, but very, very few quail. And then, of course, with the very intensive habitat improvement practices that are going on now, it's having 
not much of an effect on increasing the quail population. And so I've been in, involved in a debate with the rest of the wildlife profession uh, about one of the primary causes of the decline being not habitat or uh, decline, but uh, excessive predation. We've had a tremendous increase in both mammalian predators and avian predators. Mammalian predators such as raccoons, possum, and foxes mm -hmm. that eat the eggs of the quail. Right. And as a result of the fact that our animal rights friends have killed the fur industry. See, back until, well, back when we were trapping raccoons, like the Davy Crockett right. hat, you remember, exactly. see, okay? Right. We had not anywhere near as many of those animals as we have today. And possums, too. People used to trap possums also, um, and foxes. Uh, but uh, we, we no longer trap those animals, and so we've had a tremendous increase in those. And then also, uh, the urbanization of society and the vertical integration of the poultry industry have also had an effect. Now, that's far-fetched, it sounds like, for, mm -hmm. as far as quail are concerned, but what has happened is that as people have moved off the land and we no longer have all these very small farms which provide very good habitat, we now have mega farms, see, and our poultry is being produced not on, on small farms but right. on, in factories. Right. So back when people lived on the land and had their own chickens and so forth, and when a hawk came to get into the chicken coop, there was a shotgun behind the kitchen door, and he went out and took care of the situation. And I remember many times I'd be driving into a farm. Uh, this was back in the 50s and 60s. And there was a hawk or an owl nailed to the barn door or fence post. To scare them away. That was a standard thing. You saw it all mm -hmm. over the place, see. Nobody doing it, that anymore. There's no incentive to kill mm -hmm. hawks. And one in particular, the Cooper's hawk, which lives almost entirely on birds, including quail, has increased tremendously. The National Breeding Bird Survey shows that is, uh, it increased more rapidly. The only bird species that recovered more rapidly than the Cooper's hawk was the bald eagle. And that yes. averaged 9.5% per year. The Cooper's hawk, 5.5% per year. So that two numbers, from 66 to 1966, 1996, in that 30 year period, we had a 500% increase in Cooper's hawks. See, wow. See. wow. And they breed all over the continent of the United States. See. Absolutely. Oh, you see the them South, all the time. See. And the literature on the Cooper's hawk is that they are so intolerant of one another that they will not allow another pair to nest within four or five miles of their own nest. Wow. See. But, a few years ago, a Dr. Robert Rosenfield, who is the world authority on Cooper's hawks, wrote a little story to the effect that he found seven Cooper's hawks nests within a quarter of a mile of each other within the city limits of Stevens Point, Wisconsin, see? So, so that intraspecific intolerance is just a myth, you see? Mm -hmm. If there's plenty of food, there's plenty of Cooper's hawks. So instead of 4,000, acres per nest, there's 40 acres per nest, a hundredfold increase over what we had back then. So you ask yourself the question, now, is Stevens Point, Wisconsin the only place that this happened, see? Or is this the maximum number? Could there be more than that, see? And what if in North Carolina we had a pair of Cooper's hawks in every 40 acres? The quail would have a hard time because, so see, so. But these are questions that I've been trying to get state agencies to research, see? And they're very reluctant to do it because the Cooper's hawk is such a beautiful bird, see. Mm -hmm. And to kill the Cooper's hawk, well, it'd just be, be the socially incorrect thing to do, see. Mm -hmm. so, um, I love the quail, though. Uh, well, the quail are beautiful birds, see. Yes, they and, are. Like these, I love I the Bob yeah. White sound <laughs> Bob they White, make. Yeah. Uh, and so uh, the, they have, well, the Southeast Quail Study Group, of which I'm a member, uh, consists of all of the quail biologists in the United States, see, set up by the state agencies in 1995, and they have a meeting every year, and now they have come up with a plan to restore the quail on a landscape scale basis, see. But it, it's, it's not going to work because it's based on the assumption that if we can rest 
uh, restore the what they call the early successional vegetation, which quail like to have, right. um, to the same level that we had in 1980, that uh, we'll have the same number of quail as we had in 1980, and completely ignoring the predation element, see? Right. Um, and there are places where they have done quite a bit of restoration, and the theory is that if you restore habitat not on just a single farm, but on a large acreage of farm, say like 5,000 acres or so, that you'll have much better chance of accomplishing that objective. And are the pesticides and that sort of thing used on many of these farms detrimental to them as well? That could have an effect, but mm -hmm. you see, pesticides are now much more target specific, see? True. And um, uh, while early pesticides were having a, a significant impact, the research at the university indicates that modern day pesticides are not having that much of an impact on quail populations. I right? must say, I wonder sometimes about things like Roundup, the weed killers. Well, We're Roundup, no longer using yeah, DDT, no. but some of the other things. The, the Roundup, of course, is, a, is an herbicide, right. but uh, there are uh, insecticides. But a lot of it's used. A lot of it is used, but um, it is, um, the research does not show that it has had uh, mm -hmm. any impact it on quail. It does quails. break I'm down then. No, no. And it's fairly, fairly short-lived, too, mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. that's another point in its favor. Now, I also understand that you haven't farm and you grow Christmas trees. Uh, yes, I do. I, I have a 22-acre farm and uh, I have eight acres in trees, but in deference to farther time, I'm reducing the tree acreage, the Christmas tree acreage, to five acres, see, so I'm allowing two of my fields to grow up into loblolly pine to keep them in timber, see, but it's going to take another two or three years before they are completely converted to Are you lobby planting pine. the trees or are you just allowing uh, them naturally oh, evolution? No, no, I'm, I'm plant, I plant, mm -hmm, I plant mm -hmm. about 2,000 trees every year, see, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and of course you have to mow to keep the grass and weeds under control. This is your Christmas trees? That's my Christmas trees, yes. No, yes. I was thinking about the pot where you're letting the pines grow. That's just a natural. Well, no, I keep, I want to keep that open also mm -hmm. for quail habitat, say, for nesting mm -hmm. habitat, so I'll be mowing that. Continuously. Tell us how you take care of Christmas trees and what you plant and what's involved. Because it's well, such a big industry <laughs> in North Carolina now. Well, actually, the industry in North Carolina, the bulk of the industry is in western North Carolina where right. they raise Fraser firs. Fraser firs don't grow here in the east where it's too warm for it. They have I to be, thought. I think, over 3,000 feet. And so I raise six different kinds of trees, white pine, Virginia pine, cedar, and Leyland cypress, Carolina sapphire, and green giant arborvitae. And um, I have what we call a choose and cut operation. People come to the farm to buy their trees. And uh, of course, that means that uh, uh, we also do something that other people don't do. We allow people to reserve trees because we put a price tag on every tree, and the price tag tells us not just the price, but also where the tree is, what field, row position, and so forth. And so when we record the deposit for the uh, payment of, of the tree, reservation of the tree, we also record the location of the tree. And so if that person wants us to cut the tree for them, they call up a day or two ahead, ahead of time, let the tree all cut, dead needle shaken out with the machine, and put in the bag, ready for them to pick it when they get there. So it's a service that we provide that you don't get many other places. Do you ball any for trans? No, we don't do that. You don't, we do, don't that. do that, only cut trees. The problem with balling is that you've got to have a big hydraulic shell to do mm -hmm. the digging, see? And then that leaves a hole, and then I've got to fill the hole up too, mm -hmm. so. Mm -hmm. That's just too much of a bother. So, you know, now, you plant these trees when they're very small. Yes. And, and how do you nurture them and get them into what we buy as Christmas trees? Well, it takes about six years see, for them to grow. And, of course, you've got to direct their growth because Virginia pine particularly would rather be a bush than a tree. So you've got to shape them. And right now I'm in the process of shaping trees. When they get to be about four or five feet tall, you've got to start put, make, putting that cone shape on them. And uh, I'm about two-thirds of the way through, uh, shaping now. You use a machine that looks like a weed eater that has a saw blade on the end of it. You just walk around the tree up and down like this, you see up to the top, and a 10-foot tree, you know, way on up there. That's so. hard work? Well, it is, but it's, you sweat some, but uh, I enjoy it. I don't mm -hmm. mind sweating, I enjoy hard work. On a day like this, that would be difficult. Well, I only work till, I quit the day at uh, 10.30, so 
You start yeah. early and leave early. Yeah, I start. I start at six o'clock in the morning. Though it was just daylight, mm -hmm, light enough mm -hmm. to see. So I went out, and it was quite comfortable. And you have to keep the area underneath mowed and cleared. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. So that they're getting maximum. Do you have to fertilize them as well? Oh yes, fertilize them, mm -hmm. and also not just fertilize the ground, but we have what we call a foliar nutrient. So we mm -hmm. fertilize the veg mm -hmm, the, the mm -hmm. tree itself. So, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so it's. It keeps me busy. It keeps me out of mischief, see, so that if I do that, well, I might be getting in trouble somewhere, so mm -hmm. <laughs> it keeps me. Well, that's, that's one of the things that it does for lots of people. That's why we need it activities. Keeps me Actually, I think I get more benefit out of the exercise than out of the money because... Uh, right. You're probably, probably not that lucrative. Well, it's not that, not that great, see. But if it's you fun, want to I'm work sure. hard, see, and not make much money, raise Christmas trees. Good. So, so. Well, that's a good thing to know. <laughs> now, I understand you've recently gotten into canoeing. Well, actually, I've been canoeing for a long time, see. I uh, started on Cranberry Lake in the Adirondacks about 1937 at Forestry Summer Camp. I went to forestry school at Syracuse University. Mm -hmm. And so we had summer camp, and so and it was on this big lake, so I was canoeing there. And we had, had to go to side camp, and side camp was up a river. We had to canoe up the river, set up camp, and all that sort of thing. So that was a lot of fun. And I bought, a, I bought a paddle then in 1937, so, but I've been wanting to canoe the eastern North Carolina streams. I had built a John boat several years ago, and that finally, after about 14 years, finally fell apart. But uh, so in the year 2004, I bought a canoe to go with a paddle that I bought in 1937, so. so. Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> That's called recycling, right? <laughs> <laughs> Something. And so now, I've got to get the book, there's several books uh, published on Eastern North Carolina streams and they're beautiful, beautiful streams, you know, meandering streams with, uh, go through some rather wild places and you're in a totally different world, very quiet, very clean and uh, it's, it's just a lovely experience. Do you do this by yourself or you go with a well, group? Well, I'm trying. Well, there's some groups, you see. I'm trying to get with some groups mm -hmm, just mm -hmm. for safety purposes. Exactly, and that's what I was I've wondering. I've got a friend in Bladenborough. No, in Elizabethtown, that uh, I plan to do some streams Good. with. Yeah. I would think in those isolated areas, if you're there by yourself and. Well, for safety purposes, exactly. because you know I have cotton mouth, cotton right. mouth moccasins right. and that sort of thing too. Absolutely. So, you know, right. You've got to be careful about that. Right. So. Uh, and some of the snakes here can be rather uh, vicious. Well, the cotton mouths are very aggressive. See. Exactly. Yeah. The copperheads yeah. are yeah. not so. Yeah. Copperheads. Are, well, you step well the off. cotton mouth are basically, basically in the water. Yes, the water, they're always so near water, yes. That makes it worse. Yeah, yeah. I understand you recently had a great time in Greece. Oh, yes, yes. Uh, we went there for about 10 days, and uh, we were walking in the footsteps of Paul, see. Started mm -hmm. at Thessalonica, and then worked our way south. And uh, it, what, what impressed me as much as the ruins uh, and the, the antiquities and so forth was the geology and the vegetation. Uh, there are a few trees, so no trees. All these uh, low mountains uh, with just some shrubs and grass and weeds on them. And I'm assuming that comes from 3,000 years of grazing by sheep and goats. I'm not sure that that's mm -hmm. the answer, but so very few trees. And uh, what we saw the one, one place that we thought I saw that was especially interesting I thought was Ephesus, which is not in Greece, but it's on the west coast of Turkey. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, Paul was there too, and he wrote a letter to the Ephesians and so on. But that place had been under, Ephesus had been under uh, soil, about 30 feet of soil, erosion from the hillside mountains and so forth, for all these thousands couple thousand years, and they have recently started excavating it. It's about 15% excavated now, and uh, it's, it's really uh, a very, very amazing thing. You know, we tend to think that each generation tends to think that it has a monopoly on intelligence, see. Mm -hmm. But back then, 2,500 years ago, they were able to carve these huge pieces of marble and put the... Uh, each block weighing several tons and pile them on top of one another. Isn't it too. amazing? It's amazing how they were able to do that. Without so. the equipment that yeah. we have today. Mm -hmm. 
I presume they did with block and tackle and auction ramps mm -hmm, and so mm -hmm. forth, but even that, you know, mm -hmm. with such precision, it was just mm -hmm. really amazing. The engineers were amazing, mm -hmm. weren't they? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So now you went with your church. It sounds yeah. like church is very important to you. Is that something well, that's a major uh, influence yes or in no. your life? Uh, mm -hmm. Not really, not really. I'm not a very religious person, but no. uh, this was a group, and I wanted to go on with a group uh, uh, to see mm -hmm. uh, this part of the world. So I've been to Venezuela, been to Mexico, been to Yucatan, been to Great Spokies and um, Yellowstone and uh, Puerto Rico and place mm -hmm. like and Hungary. But I hadn't been to Greece, so I wanted to go to Greece and, and see. Uh, so this is so this yeah. was a dream that you had yes, mm -hmm. that you were able to bring to right. fruition. Mm -hmm. Great. Mm -hmm. You plan to go back? Well, I want to go back to Hungary one more time. See. And well, I think we didn't say that you were born in Hungary. Oh, well. <laughs> well, and yes. came here as a young young right. child, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. So, so you want to go back to your roots and visit? Mm -hmm. Right, one, one more time, uh, anyway, to see, to visit those people. But one one, one problem is that uh, many of my relatives that were there in '82 and '85 are gone now. See, so um, that's one problem with getting old. You outlive other people, and right. so right. your peers and so on. So, but you you seem so active that you defy age. Well, I think it's just simply a matter of the old axiom, you know, use it or lose it, see. Right. Just keep on working, working hard, and uh, like having I Having goals in your life. And doing things, you know, and mm -hmm. Uh, mm -hmm. just having fun, that's mm -hmm. all, so. Mm -hmm. And you, you, did your family influence you to become so involved with wildlife and appreciation of nature? Was that a value in your family you grew up? Well, no. We I, I grew up in a small town in the Catskills in New mm -hmm. York State, see. And uh, my buddy and I, we spent most of our time not playing ball, but uh, looking for snakes and frogs and fishing mm -hmm. and hunting and trapping and things mm -hmm, like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that translated on into into being interested in. in my, I owe my college education to my Latin teacher, see. Good. Back then, people took... I'm sorry, we're running out of time. This has just been so great. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much for sharing. Well, and thank you for all that you've done for well, all of us thank in you, preserving sir. the uh, nature and the animals as much as you have. Well, we'll you. forgive you for the doer, deer. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate thank that. Thank you very much, Mr. Perry. There's a myth going round town that when you get older you just sit down and start rocking just rocking in a way that's true if you know what i mean just take a look at the senior scene well it's rocking yeah it's rocking we're pulling our weight learning the code Clicking our heels, sharing the load, and every so often we're hitting the road. Yeah, we're rocking.